So the second example says, solve the following equation over the same interval, and you'll see that a lot. Usually when it's theta as our variable, it's going to be in degrees. And if they would have replaced the thetas with the x's, then that would have meant zero to two pi instead. So this one obviously is a little bit more involved because it has multiple, three in this case, trig functions. And of course, we're trying to get them by themselves. And since there's not just one, we can't do that. So the first step is going to be to get them all on one side. And since the cosine on the right side of my equation is already negative, I'm gonna go ahead and add cosine to both sides. Now be careful. I know you guys recognize your algebra rules, only add and subtract like terms and things like that. You gotta make sure that you see this the same way. Right now, this is similar to writing x times y on the left, where x is cosine and y is cotangent, and it would be equal to negative x on the right side. And if I actually took this and added it over, would I be able to add the x, y, and the x? Remember, these are multiplied together. That is one whole term. So no, you will not be able to add just the x's. You would actually get x plus x, y equals zero. Okay, so be careful. Same type of idea over on the other side. When I add the cosine over to get all of that equal to zero, I'm still going to be left with cosine theta cotangent theta plus that cosine theta that we added over. But hopefully you see what the next step would be. Because we got it set equal to zero, now we look to factor in order to solve this. And just like we would have here, we would have factored out an x to get one plus y. Then we could set each of those things, those factors equal to zero. In this case, we're gonna do the exact same thing. These are multiplied together plus that other cosine. We know each of those has a cosine theta that we can factor out. And by doing that, we will be left with, since those are multiplying, remember that's the only time that we can ever cancel anything, that becomes a one, and I get cotangent theta, plus that becomes a one, equals zero. Remember that doesn't just cancel out and disappear. We're mathematicians, not magicians. We can't just make things disappear. Just kidding, I'm back. So with this, remember, now that I have this factor times that factor, I will go off to the side and set the first factor equal to zero, as well as the second factor, which is co, excuse me, cotangent theta plus one. And now we're back to where we were in the previous problem, where we have one unknown, in this case, a trig function, equals zero or some number. And in this case, when I subtract the one over, I will have a trig function equals negative one. And for this one, cosine theta equals zero. And hopefully you guys remember how to solve those. If not, that's what I'm here for, help you through it. So where is cosine equal to zero? Well, remember cosine is always x over r, so we're looking for zero over one. And in this case, I know that x is equal to zero in two places in particular. That's when I'm not left or right any. And since they gave us theta, they want it in degrees. Two of our answers would be 90 degrees and 270 degrees. Now doing something similar over here for cotangent. Remember cotangent is x over y. And hopefully you remember for tangent and cotangent, we really liked it when it was equal to one. Hopefully you remember the reference angle. The reference angle for that would be 45 degrees. But remember, because it's negative, like it is here, then we need to make sure that we are in the proper quadrant. And in this case, that would put us in, since tangent and cotangent are the same positive and negative, just reciprocal of their fractions, we know that the negative for cotangent 
would definitely not be in quadrant one. And be careful, this C does not stand for cotangent, it stands for cosine. So it would be where tangent is also positive. So the two quadrants that we would be looking at for this one would be for that 45 degree reference angle in both quadrants two and four. So hopefully you know that that would be 135 degrees. If I just do 180 less 45 and then 360 less 40 is 320 less five is 315. And so there's all four of my possible solutions. The only thing that they're gonna want you to do is make sure that you write them in ascending order. So when they put them in say a multiple choice situation or they want you to list the solution set, they're gonna want you to put it from smallest to biggest. I'm not a stickler on that, but just in case you're wondering why they put them in a specific order. So you can see we actually came up with four answers for this one because there was more going on. We ended up with more answers. So this next one you can see changes a little bit, not only in appearance, but also with the solutions that they are asking. Now it's from zero to two pi. And in this case, hopefully you recognize that for one, it's already set equal to zero and two, it looks very similar to stuff that we've seen in the past. Some of you guys may be familiar with a little thing called U substitution, where if you didn't like the way that it looked, use something that you do like. And everybody likes U, of course. So in this case, we're going to replace whatever the middle term is with U. And so if I'm going to call this my U right here, sine x, then I want to call everything u, or at least have my entire equation in terms of u. So if you notice, I have another sine x right here, but this one's being squared. So when I rewrite this, I'll be able to rewrite this as 3u squared minus u minus 2 equals 0. And if I gave you that problem right there, hopefully you'd recognize that it is what kind of equation because it has the power of two, hopefully you said quadratic. And in this case, we know the quickest, easiest method to solving a quadratic equation is actually not the quadratic function, right? Or excuse me, the quadratic formula, but rather factoring. That's why we learned how to do it first. So in this case, I'm gonna do a little guess and check, which isn't that difficult because both my ends are prime numbers. So I know the only thing that's going to give me a three u squared is a three u times a u. And the only thing that's going to give me two is a one times a two. So I know that either the one and the two go there or the two and the one there. All we have to figure out is what would give me the negative one in the middle. That's always the key. Start with the outsides and then try to make sure that when you distribute foil, you get that negative one in this case in the middle. So I know that I'm going to be focusing on the three because it is the biggest. And I know that if I plug that in to multiply to the two first, that would be too big because that would be six. And then I'd just be left with a one here and a one there, which when I subtract, not nearly close enough to one. So in this case, I know that I'm going to put the bigger number with the bigger number and the smaller number with the smaller number. So I'm going with that pair. Now, when I multiply, I don't have to check the first two because I know that gives me three u squared. I don't have to check the last two because I know that's going to give me the two. What I do need to make sure is that one, my signs are correct. And also that I get a negative one when I do that. And so in order to make sure that I get that, I know that when I do the three times the one, I get three U. And when I do the two times the one here, I will get two U. So I know that this is the one that I want negative and this positive. So when I do the three U times the one, I want that to be the negative. And when I do the U times the two, I want that to be positive. And so to clean this up a little bit, I will rewrite it so that you see plain and simple, this is what we have. We factored just like we always have, but with 
instead of the x squared and x that we're used to seeing, we originally, if you remember up at the top, had sine x squared and sine x. So unfortunately, if you remember at the beginning, we let u equal sine x. We didn't have u originally in this equation. So unfortunately, sorry everyone, we got to get rid of u. So what we have to do is go back and re-let what we originally let u equal there and there into this equation. So I'll rewrite this as 3 instead of u, sine x plus 2 times instead of u, sine x minus 1. And now this looks and resembles the problem example that we just did. I will now take this factor and set it equal to zero and this factor and set it equal to zero. Now I've got it down to just one trig function and I will get it by itself and then get rid of the trig function by solving for the angle, in this case x. So first step in the first equation, subtract two to both sides. Now I'm left with three sine x equals negative two. And over here, I will add one to both sides so that I get sine x equals one. Now that one I can actually finish right then and there because I know that sine is equal to one when both the y and the r are both one. And that only happens at one place, which is right there. 90 degrees, or in this case, because it's x, pi over 2. And that equation is done. That is the only. They don't always come paired up. Most of the time, yes, they will. But if it's a quadrantal angle, then no, they do not have to. Because if I went down here, that would be a negative 1, and that's not what we had. We had positive 1 only. So that would only be at pi over 2. Now, the other one, if you notice, when I go and I divide by 3, what we're used to seeing there is all of those reference angle outputs, root 3 over 2, root 2 over 2, 1 half, root 3, root 3 over 3. This isn't any of those. So unfortunately, we have to go back to what we just learned in the previous section with inverses, and we have to rewrite this so that we can plug it in. Now, first of all, don't forget, where is sine equal to a negative? Well, that's not in quadrants one and two. So first I need to find the reference angle and then I need to use the reference angle in order to put it into the proper quadrants. Because remember at the very beginning of this, they asked for solutions strictly between zero and two pi. So as I go back to that, I'm gonna rewrite it by Remember, our whole goal is to get what by itself? Hopefully you said x. So I'm gonna actually take this and this, my input and my output, and I'm gonna flip-flop them. I'm gonna reverse their order, and hopefully you remember, when do we reverse the order? When we are using the inverse. So I'm going to be taking the arc sine or inverse sine of negative two thirds to find what my x is equal to. And in order to do that, I gotta go back to my trusty calculator and I will hit the inverse sine of, remember to use the negative, not the subtraction sign, two thirds. And when I hit equals, you can see what kind of angle did it give me. And hopefully you notice an acute. Even though it's negative, it's still acute. So negative 41.81 is what I got. But remember, that's actually in degrees. I'd have to either change my calculator to radians or do it here by doing the whole multiplying by that fancy one again of pi over 180 you're going to have to change that, okay? And when you do that, since I already have that up, I'll go ahead and multiply that by pi and then divide by 180 degrees. And notice I get a big nasty decimal, negative 
And now that I have that, remember, unfortunately, this is only my reference angle. We have to make sure that that, which right now, as you can see, is negative. I have to make sure that I only provide things that are positive, zero to two pi. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky at the very end here. You're gonna have to make sure that you take that value and you put it into the proper quadrants. So it's not that bad, but it is an extra step and a lot of people will possibly forget that. I need to put this in these two quadrants, which since it's in radians, remember this is pi. And all I'd have to do is add that 7297 and also two pi, I'd have to subtract that 7297. And that would give me my two correct answers for this one, which if I do that, I will get two more answers, one of 3.8713 and the other 5.5535. So just to show you how you can do that on the calculator, again, that negative 0.7297, I'm actually gonna take that and add pi to it. So if you can see it right here, I'm gonna add 3.14 and you can already see negating putting it as a negative, just using that as my reference angle, I get 3.8 and then continuing on with all the other decimals. All right, and then same thing here, two pi, remember would be 6.28-ish. And if I added, or excuse me, in this case, subtracted the 0.72, you can see that we'd end up getting our 5.5-ish, okay? So my final answers for this entire equation, we knew one of them exactly was pi over two. So we can just list that one. And then the other two didn't work out so nice. So we'd put something like this, depending on how many decimal places they ask for. And that. And that would represent all three possible solutions between, again, zero and two pi. So a little bit more carefulness needed, but let's go over one more type and then let you guys practice this on your own. Let's see one that is a little bit more involved than even that. And this one requires, because if I move stuff around, I won't be able to factor out, it's not gonna look quadratic, um, there's more than one trig function, sometimes you gotta get creative. And in this one, unfortunately, because I have a cotangent and a cosecant, I'm gonna square both sides. Because hopefully you guys remember the Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared of any angle, as long as it's the same, is equal to one. And then we said we could divide all of those by either sine or all of them by cosine. And if I divided all of them by sine, I'd get a one. Cosine over sine is cotangent squared. And then one over sine squared would be cosecant squared. And then the other, just to make sure we have them all, divide all of that by cosine. If I divide this, this, and that by cosine, now I'd get tangent squared plus one equals secant squared. And so remember, any time that you have a squared trig function, you should be thinking of the Pythagorean. Even though in this particular problem, we had to square it in order to get the ball rolling here. Because if I subtract that over and try to get it set equal to zero, I'd still just have a cosecant and a cotangent. Nothing I could really do there. So in this case, I'm gonna have to take the cotangent of x minus the square root of three times the cotangent of x minus the square root of three. That's what squared means. And I'm gonna to have to actually take this and FOIL distributed it out. So in this case, when I do the cotangent times cotangent, I get to co uh, excuse me, cotangent squared. And then when I do it times the negative root three, I get negative root three times cotangent x. Can't physically multiply them, so I just write them next to each other. Then when I distribute the negative root three to that, I get another negative root three cotangent x. And then careful, negative times negative would be positive, 
root three times root three would be square root of nine or three. So in this case, combining all of my like terms here, I would now have cotangent squared x minus two of my root three cotangent x's plus three, and it'd all be equal to cosecant squared. Now you're looking at me and you're like, why did you do that? That wasn't fun, first of all. And secondly, it doesn't look any better. It actually looks worse. Now, the one thing you should recognize, though, is that we now have squared trig functions. And hopefully you recognize we have one in particular right here. And the nice thing is this is cotangent squared and this is cotangent and it almost resembles our previous problem that we just did that looked quadratic in form. But if you notice, if I replace the cosecant squared with what it's equivalent to, all that identity work that we just worked on last chapter, now you can see I can replace that with another cotangent, which if I rewrite down all the stuff I had on the left, now hopefully this starts to resemble something that we're familiar with something that we might be able to do things with, and that is now get it set equal to zero. So first I will subtract one to both sides. And rather than having to write this all down again, because that zero is out, I would also then subtract the cotangent squared to both sides, which also would zero this all out. So now I got my whole equation set equal to zero like we're used to seeing, but look what happens as well on the left side these cotangents because one's negative and one's positive also cancel out so although we were looking to put it in quadratic form it actually worked out nice that it ends up just being linear in form where there's only one variable so notice what is left we got a negative two root three cotangent x and then three minus one so positive two and hopefully you recognize this looks very similar to what we've done. And so we'll just get that trig function by itself by subtracting two over first. So that gives me negative two root three cotangent X equals negative two. And then my next step would be to undo the multiplying by dividing both sides by negative two root three, because then that would make this positive and one. So now I got my cotangent X by itself. That also makes a positive one there, but that leaves us with one over root three. And if you recall, most of you didn't like or prefer the reciprocal functions like cotangent. So if you wanted to, you could do the reciprocal of the left of my equal sign as long as you flip the right side as well. And if you rewrite cotangent as one over cotangent, that gives us tangent which would give us root three. And hopefully you all know where tangent is equal to root three. Don't forget, that's two places. They want all of the solutions from zero to two pi. So in this case, if I was to take that and solve for it, then we know that there is a possible solution in quadrants one and three. And again, because it's X, they want it in radians. So we're looking at a reference angle of pi over three or 60 degrees. And another, if this is pi, I can rewrite that pi as a weird looking one of three pi over three. Because all I need to do is go another reference angle of pi over three, which would give me four pi over three. And unfortunately, a lot of you guys would put those as your two answers, and unfortunately, you'd be wrong. And you're looking at me like we did all of that work to get that problem wrong. Well, here's why. Remember the very first step. We squared both sides. If I go and I put something down here for you, like what equals 9 when I square x? And a lot of you would say 3. X is equal to three, but so would what? Negative three, that's right. So the difference being that when you square things, 
sometimes they come out incorrect. Where right now, if I put those things in there, yes, it's correct. But if I go and I took the square root of these things, then obviously I'd have an X there and I'd have it equal to three. And if I replaced either one of these in what you told me the original answer was, but say this is my original problem, like we had up above, before we squared them, and each of these was not squared yet, then you would have negative three equals three, which is incorrect. So every time, I don't know if you guys remember this from algebra, that you square both sides of the equation, you have to make sure that you go check. Because if I square this and I square that, even though we know it's not true, you get nine equals nine, you get something that is true. So when we took the original problem and we squared both sides, that's actually what we went through and solved. We went through all of that work and solved to get those two answers, but not for our original problem, which was this. It was for when we squared it. So if you notice, you're going to have to go back to your original problem, and you're going to have to test whether either or both of these actually indeed give you solutions. So in this case, I know we're dealing with pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. So in this case, I'm going to check pi over 3 first, which is 60 degrees. And I know the tangent of 60 is root 3. So the cotangent of 60 is going to be root 3 over 3. And if I subtract a 3, root 3 over 3, which hopefully you can see my 1 there, I end up with negative 2 root 3 over 3. And so my question is, is that equal to cosecant of pi over 3? And in this case, we know cosecant is the same as 1 over sine of my 60 degrees. And hopefully you know that the sine of 60 is root 3 over 2. So in this case, we'd have to do the reciprocal of that, which would be 2 over root 3. However, I don't even have to rationalize it. How come? What hopefully did you recognize? Are these equal? No, because this one's negative and this one's positive. So right then and there, we unfortunately have to toss that as a possible solution. Okay. The nice thing about this is there is one solution, and I'm not going to go through it. You can check on your own, but 4 pi over 3 does work. So the only answer we would have on this would be 4 pi over 3 by plugging that into each of those. All right, so that's it. That's all I have for you for this section. Hopefully you understood the ins and outs of solving equations. You may have to be careful brushing up on a little bit of your uh, algebra. But again, the goal is still to get the variable by itself. In this case, our variable is oftentimes a trig function. Get that by itself first, and then you can think about the whole inverse thing to get the angle by itself. All right, guys. Good luck. Take care.